Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of This Week in the World of Football. This is episode number 266 for October 18th, 2022. I'm your host, Randy Snow. On today's show, Bill Belichick has tied George Hallis for the second most wins in NFL, NFL history, and a player gets thrown off a team in the middle of a game, then traded the very next day. In this week's history lesson, we have part seven of our discussion of the greatest player nicknames in football history. But I'm not here by myself. Across the table for me, as always, is my son Adam. Yes, no Lions game this past weekend, so nope. I didn't. I didn't have to sit through any heartbreak. I actually sat through the <laughs> bunch of good endings of some games this weekend. Yeah, I actually took the time to uh, go uh, have lunch with some uh, pro football researcher association friends over in Frankenmuth. We'll talk a little bit about that later, I guess. And uh, um, yeah, it was a good weekend all around. No, no loss for the Lions and uh, a nice visit with some friends. We are coming to you from the fabulous World of Football Man Cave, located right here in the center of the football world, Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're here to promote the game of football in all its many forms, past, present, and future. Our goal is to educate, inform, and entertain our listeners with the glorious buffet that is the world of football. All this while keeping a close eye on the rich history of the game. Thanks for checking out our podcast. We'd love to get your feedback on one of our many platforms. Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, where we post the entire audio portion of this show, as well as other selected videos. So let's begin today's show with Adam and the World of Football scoreboard. That's right. We're going to start things off in the NFL and in that Thursday night prime, you know, Amazon Prime game, which has been nothing but a snooze fest the oh, last man. few weeks. Yeah, it's been been tough to watch. Yep. And speaking of tough to watch, I mean, when I went to bed during that Bears-Commanders game on uh, Thursday, it was 3 nothing going into the half. Mm-hmm. Bunch of missed opportunities. Man, this was not a fun game to watch at all. I was surprised to wake up to find out the score was 12-7 to <laughs> at the end of the night uh, in favor of the Commanders, who got their second win of the season. I really don't have much else from this game. Yeah, it was, it was bad. But the other big thing for this week is upsets, and we start with the upset of the 49ers falling to the Atlanta Falcons 28-14. to How about that one? Then the New England Patriots beat the Browns, as expected, 38-15. to Here's your other upset. The New York Jets went into Lambeau and just kicked the crap out of the Packers 27-10 to to advance to 4-2 and two on the season. How about the New York Jets? That was awesome. I mean, we didn't have a Lions game to watch, but it was so satisfying to see the Packers lose. So, yes, that was that was a great, great day. We, we watched a little of that a little bit when, when we were having lunch, but... Uh, Man, what a nice, what a nice uh, gift on a bye week for Detroit. For sure, uh, not that Detroit will take advantage of that, but the Indianapolis Colts uh, got a last-second victory over the Jacksonville Jaguars, thirty-four to twenty-seven. That was a heck of a play to win the game. The Minnesota Vikings continue their winning ways over the Miami Dolphins, twenty-four to sixteen. The Cincinnati Bengals roared back against the New Orleans Saints, thirty to twenty-six. The Baltimore Ravens let another one slip through their fingers this year, yeah. falling to the New York Giants forty or sorry, twenty four to twenty. You know, uh, did they did they really let that slip through their fingers, or are the Giants just uh, getting to be I, a pretty good team? I think nowadays? Lamar Lamar definitely was not on top of his game there mm. at the end of that game. They were up, they were looking fine, then all of a sudden, yeah, the Giants. I mean, did what they needed to do, but Lamar yeah. just uncharacteristically fumbling the ball a couple of times, mm. definitely leading to some Giants points and. Uh, sw- swapping momentum. So, hey, congratulations to the Giants. We're yep. now five and one on the season. Wow. Who, who would have thought yep. that no. going into this year? <laughs> That's good for them. All right, here's your other upset: the Pittsburgh Steelers defeated the Tampa Bay Buccaneers twenty to eighteen. Another satisfying win from afar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Los Angeles Rams avoided a scared defeat in the Panthers twenty four to ten in that one. Yep. Uh, the big story out of this one is, of course, the wide receiver Robbie Anderson for the Panthers getting kicked out of the game by his own coach. Yep. And we're going to talk about him again in a little bit. Yep. Uh, the Arizona Cardinals uh, just haven't been able to show up lately as they fall to the Seahawks 19 to 9. The Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs delivered on probably the best game of the NFL weekend. Yeah. Uh, a th- heck of a thriller there as the Bills got the 24 20 win. Patrick Mahomes tried to do another magical comeback there in the last minute or so of the game, but yep. got intercepted. Yep. So that was Buffalo, you know, rising to the occasion. But these two teams were so evenly matched. It was yeah. almost almost a repeat of that 
uh, conference championship game or uh, divisional game, whatever that was when they yeah, played last, game year. last year. Well, I had a feeling it was going to be whoever had the ball in their hands last. <laughs> and unfortunately, it didn't work quite that way because Kansas City did have the ball in their hands last. But, you know, if not for an interception, they could have worked their way down the field and and uh, scored and won the game. But. There was a lot, I don't want to make excuses for Kansas City, but there was a lot of, I thought, some ticky-tack calls and non-calls during this yeah, game. Yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of things, you know, face mask here and there and holding that, that you could see on TV, and even the commentators were saying, well, there's a penalty right there. And a pass interference call that they called on the offense when I was like, really, you're calling that? Like The dude barely looked like he even touched the wide receiver. Like, it was mm-hmm. some baffling calls. Uh, so whatever, I'm not going to sit here and blame officials. But, I mean, give Buffalo their credit. I mean, yep. they did what they needed to do, and they looked good doing it. And Kansas yep. City still looked good. They just, you know, came up short and yeah. just one bad throw. Yeah, if and when they meet again, uh, it could be a totally different uh, result. Who knows? Yeah, we'll find out. And then on Sunday night, the Philadelphia Eagles took care of the Dallas Cowboys 26-17, to giving Cooper Rush only his first loss of his <laughs> NFL career. Uh, Another satisfying win I, for, for Lions fans. <laughs> I, I guess. Well, we'll see what Lions play the Cowboys next week. Yeah, so we'll that's see. true. Yeah, just, who knows what's going to happen out when Detroit goes down there. And then on Monday Night Football, the Denver Broncos got into another overtime skirmish, falling to the Los Angeles Chargers 19-16. to uh, I believe uh, the Broncos have scored no more than 16 points at all this season in any other game. So. Yeah, that, that was overtime. Like I said, I... <laughs> Fell asleep watching that game, but <laughs> I mean, at first I thought you know Russ was actually playing well, but then yeah. I saw a stat that said he only completed three passes the rest of the game after mm-hmm. the first half, mm-hmm. so not good. Yeah, no, nope. uh, a bit of a snoozer, but uh, uh, you know, and, and I really did think that that Denver was going to win that game. They uh, they looked like they were yeah, ready they to like the, they were ready at the start to start of that game, and, and then was it uh, Justin Herbert uh, broke an NFL record for? completing or i think he attempted 57 passes hmm. in the game and didn't throw a single touchdown in a win hmm. that that's like a league record i had not seen that yeah uh, that, was a, that was a crazy that, stat i read this okay. morning all right all right we're gonna move on from the nfl to the canadian football league it was yes. week 19 the penultimate week <laughs> in the regular season there for the cfl no they still got two weeks to go i thought there's 20 weeks in the season uh there's there's 21 actual weekends there's okay. there's 18 games but over 21 right. weeks oh 21 weeks okay so never mind i thought it was 20 <laughs> weeks no never mind next week will be the penultimate week no two weeks from now penultimate means the week before the end does it yes that's what penultimate means that's why i was thinking if the 20th week is the last oh. week this would have been the penultimate week goodness gracious randy i thought the penultimate was the the top of the end penultimate the... means before the end oh wow well, well let's make that the word of the day then um <laughs> How about no, Randy? Okay. All, All right. right. Friday saw the Montreal Alouettes defeat the Ottawa Red Blacks 34-30 to in a rematch from Monday. What a quick turn yeah, on sure that was. On there. Uh, Ottawa led the game 24-17 at halftime, but it was a second-half comeback uh, for Montreal, uh, giving them the win and qualifying them for a playoff spot and a home playoff game. Montreal quarterback Trevor Harris completed 19 passes for 241 yards and a touchdown while Ottawa quarterback Nick Arbuckle completed 28 passes for 271 yards and two touchdowns. The Alouettes play Toronto twice in these final two weeks uh, to finish out the regular season. If they manage to win both games, mind you, mm-hmm. Montreal a big could, could end up as the East Division champs. Yeah. That, uh, big stakes. That's, I had no idea they were that close to, to winning the East. I thought Toronto was you know, walking away with it, but... Uh, yeah, there's still of a chance. Of course not. There's still a chance for, for two Montreal. weeks. Yeah. All right, then Saturday, those Toronto, or sorry, uh, Friday, the Hamilton Tiger Cats defeated the Calgary Stampeders 35 to 32. Hamilton led this game 14 to 10 going into the half, but Calgary led 32 to 27 late in that game. Hamilton scoring the game-winning touchdown with 11 seconds left in that game. For Hamilton, quarterback Dane Evans completed 17 passes for 244 yards and a touchdown, while wide receiver Tim White caught six passes for 106 yards and a touchdown. On Calgary's side, quarterback Jake Mayer completed 26 passes for 251 yards, two touchdowns, and ooh, threw three interceptions. Yeah. Uh, one that was returned for a touchdown to add a double oof on top yep. of that. Calgary kicker Rene Paredes and Hamilton kicker Seth Small both had four field goals during the game, and it was Hamilton's first win in Calgary since 2004. 2004. It's so I forgot you wrote the script, so you knew the year. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
these these were the best highlights of the week. I think this was such a, an awesome game to watch. So many plays. Uh, there's another game coming up too that uh, just had some great. Like three out of the four games were just so good to watch these highlights. Big plays, interceptions, returns. Uh, uh, you know, kickoffs return for touchdowns. Just, it was all over the place. That's why I love the Canadian Football League. I, I'm almost uh, sorry to see their season come to an end, but it's been a lot of fun watching their highlights all this year when I can't get the games on TV. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, then Saturday, I saw the Toronto Argonauts defeat the Edmonton Elks 28-23. to Edmonton was actually leading this game 16-6 to going into the half, but Toronto outscored the Elks 22-7 in that second half for the first uh, for their first win in Edmonton since 2013. Toronto did not take the lead until there was just 20 seconds, 27 seconds left in the game. Mm. Edmonton has now lost 16 straight games at home, which is uh, oof, yeah, that's a sad sounds mark. Yeah, like Detroit Lions territory. For though. Toronto, quarterback McLeod Bethel-Thompson completed 19 passes for 273 yards as well as a touchdown. Uh, kicker Boris Beatty kicked five field goals during the game. Mm. Uh, for Edmonton, quarterback Taylor Cornelius completed 18 passes for 158 yards and a touchdown, while running back Kevin Brown ran the ball 19 times for 121 yards and a touchdown. Then we had uh, wide receiver Darrell Walker caught seven passes for 114 yards. It was the 100th regular season meeting between these two teams, and according to Randy, the second best highlights of the weekend. Yeah, so like I said, so many great plays in this game. Um, just, just so much fun to watch. Uh, makes me sorry that we couldn't get to Toronto a few weeks ago to actually see a game there because, you know. We don't talk about that trip. Yeah. Uh, Toronto is one of my favorite teams, and I just I would really love to go see them play. It's been a number of years since I've been there, but uh, maybe next year we'll get, we'll get over there. All right. And also Saturday, the British Columbia Lions defeated the Winnipeg Blue Bombers 40-32. to British Columbia had the lead in this one, 27-10 going into the half, and never trailed during the game. Uh a great back and forth game with a ton of big plays from both teams. The British Columbia defense even contributed two interception returns for touchdowns during the game, one for 45 yards and another for a whopping 102 yards. While the special teams added a 94 yard punt return for a touchdown, so like wow, said, they were winning every single so way they could. Special teams was just awesome in this game. So many interceptions and returns, and oh my gosh, just like I said, three of these four games were just really, really great to watch. British Columbia quarterback Vernon Adams completed 13 passes for 138 yards and a touchdown while running back James Butler ran the ball 14 times for 104 yards as well as a touchdown. Kicker Sean White with a W-H-Y-T-E. Yeah, that's how you spell his name. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just clarifying for okay. people who are like, Sean White, the snowboarder? <laughs> no, 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 no. Added four field goals. Uh, then for Winnipeg, quarterback Drew Brown made his first career start for the Blue Bombers in place of Zach Caleros and completed 28 passes for 325 yards, as well as three touchdowns and two interceptions. Wide receiver Rashid Bailey caught 11 passes for 121 yards and two touchdowns, while wide receiver Dalton Schoen caught four passes for 82 yards and a touchdown. Uh, It was just the third loss of the season for Winnipeg, but I don't think they're too worried about it with as much as they've clinched for that. That's why they let this guy, uh, Drew Drew Brown, start the game, because... They're, they've got home field advantage anyway, so it doesn't matter. I know they want to try and get a couple extra wins or at least one extra win to set a new franchise record for wins in the season. They're they're stuck at 14 right now, and they've, they've got a couple chances to, to add another game there, uh, set a new team record. But, yeah, the, you know, the kicking game is really important up in the CFL. Yeah, that's why you see guys with four field goals in the game, five field goals in the game. You know, we only got three downs, so, you know, you, if you've got a decent kicker, you can get some points even though you can't get a first down on, on that side of the field. So... Uh, yeah, I think it's it's important to highlight all the field goals that were done up there. That maybe that's where Detroit should be looking for a new field goal kicker is out of the CFL. All right, and then uh, <laughs> also for Zach Caleros, the quarterback of uh, of the Blue Bombers, he got a nice big fat contract extension with them oh, yes, for three additional that. years. Okay, I yeah. know you didn't have that on. I didn't. Rundown. Well, I didn't see the details. I saw that he got a contract yeah. extension, but I didn't. Uh, uh, yeah. So they yeah. made a big deal about that. So that starting quarterback who's led him to a couple straight great cups could be three, be three, three in a row this year if they yeah. win it again. It'd be three in a row for him. Well, it looks like he's trying to aim for that Warren Moon level. Yeah. Championship <laughs> streak. All right, and then on by this week in the CFL, Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan the Saskatchewan <laughs> Rough Riders. Words are hard. Next game, uh, they will play the Calgary Stampeders at home. And as we look at the standings with two weeks left, uh, five of the six playoff teams have been decided. Toronto at 10-6, and six, 
and Montreal at eight and eight in the East have clinched spots, while Hamilton at six and ten and Ottawa at four and twelve are still fighting. In the West, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at fourteen and three have clinched that West. Everything runs through them. Mm-hmm. No need to even worry about playing the rest of their games with their starters. Following them, the British Columbia Lions at eleven and five and the Calgary Stampeders at ten and six have locked their playoff spots in. It's just a matter of positioning now. The last couple mm-hmm. of weeks, and then for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at six and ten and the Edmonton Elks at four and thirteen, they are also fighting. Nobody officially eliminated yet, I think, as uh, far as I could tell. Yeah, well, it's going to come down to either uh, Hamilton uh, in the East or Saskatchewan in the West being a crossover team. Uh, so that's you know both of those teams are six and ten. Uh, with a couple weeks to go, so it'll be interesting to see which one of those actually gets that last uh, playoff spot. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe a crossover team from the west to the east or three teams in the east, three teams in the west. I think I think for the last several years, since we've been doing this podcast, it seems like there's been a, a crossover team just about every year. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty common up there. All right, we're going to move on to the college football scores now. Uh, this was week seven, and we're going to start at the FBS level. We talk all levels of college football here. And this week it was n- number one Georgia shutting out Vanderbilt 55 to nothing, showing that they are the best team in the country. Uh, number two ranked Ohio State did not play this weekend, but number six Tennessee upset number three Alabama 52 to 49 on a last second field goal. Uh, I think everybody's probably seen everybody's that. Everybody's seen the highlights from this. <laughs> I even saw this as it happened. We were watching, uh, and we'll talk about the other game I was watching. I was at a wedding this weekend. They had some games on the TVs, which was awesome. Thank mm-hmm. you. Very considerate <laughs> of your guests uh, during a football Saturday. Who gets but married during football season? I, I people just who don't, don't care as much about football, but at least they were nice enough to put on TVs for people sure. who cared about some of the games. So we'll get to the other game in a minute, I'm sure. But this game, you know, after that last one wrapped up, it was immediately walking down to the bar to the second TV, which had this game on, and to see that field goal get made by Tennessee and to watch Alabama miss a field goal mm. uh, was just, I couldn't believe. <laughs> and that place went nuts. And, of course, as soon as that game was over, the referees ran out of the way, and it was just a sea yep. of orange crashing yep. down onto that field and then stealing the goal post and throwing them into the river. <laughs> what the heck is happening? And we're going to talk a little bit more about those goal pass uh, goal posts. In a those pesky goal posts. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, continuing on here with the scores. Number four, Clemson defeated Florida State thirty-four to twenty-eight. A uh, game that we watched. Number five, Michigan over number ten, Penn State forty-one to sixteen. This was kind of a close game early on. But, oh yeah, uh, I Michigan... think uh, I I started watching it. Michigan was up. I went to drive to go to the wedding. Listened to the game in the car, and it was like 17 to 16. Mm-hmm. Penn State was leading at one point. Then it was just all Michigan. Michigan finally got it figured out, yep. and it was all Michigan. <laughs> all right, number 20, Utah upset number 7, USC, 43 to 42. Wow. This was an interesting game, too. Watching this one a little bit, it looked like USC had control, but Utah just kept in it. Mm-hmm. And then Utah also repped uh, those custom helmets with the two players that passed away from the team. Mm, yeah. Uh, very cool helmets because I was watching the game like, what is the story with these helmets? I, I had no idea what that was about when I looked into it, though, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the two players that have passed away within like a year of each other mm. uh, on the team. You said so, those were all hand-painted helmets? They, that's what they said, that they were hand-painted. hand-painted. Each one. Mm. So very unique helmets. Uh, if you get a chance, go look those up, everybody. I thought those were pretty neat. Yeah. Number 13, TCU upset number 8, Oklahoma State, 43-40 to in double overtime. Number 18, Syracuse upset number 15, NC State, 24-9. to Number 2, Kentucky upset number 16, Mississippi State, 27-17. to Oklahoma upset number 19, Kansas, 52-42. to Georgia Southern upset number 25, James Madison, 45-38. to James Madison was undefeated at the time. They were 5-0, and and this uh, being their first year at the FBS level, and uh, good for them for being in the top 25 in their first year at the uh, the top level of college football. Good for them. It was Michigan State over Wisconsin, 34-28 to in overtime. This was the other game they had on at the bar. Oh, so really? we said that okay. we watched most of that last quarter, and, you know, very <laughs> exciting getting to the end of that game. You know, you thought Michigan State kind of had a handle on it, then – Wisconsin came, tied it up. They mm. go to overtime, and man, it was exciting stuff there at the end of the game. A couple of great catches, and uh, 
you know, Michigan State pulling out that victory in double overtime. There were a mm-hmm. lot of happy fans at that, that, that wedding that night. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't even see any of this game. I don't oh, know was what great. I was doing that night. It was great. That was that was the late game. I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, started at eight o'clock or seven o'clock maybe, but yeah, I did not see any of that. East Carolina uh, defeated Memphis forty-seven to forty-five in overtime. Uh, UCF over Temple seventy to three. Remember Temple? That's the team that's got uh, Kurt Warner's son as the quarterback there. At least last time. Some, I knew he some was teams playing. got Chad Pennington's son. I can't. I think it might be, hmm. might be Marshall actually. I don't know. Well, that's where his dad played, so yeah. it could be. And finally, Ohio over our beloved Western Michigan Broncos thirty-three to fourteen. This game was actually on TV. Um, I, I don't. I was going to text you and tell you that because you, you were, did text you were me gone. about it. Well, there okay. was no way I could watch it. Right, so. yeah, but I yeah I watched most of the game and oh, what a disappointment! I think Western had it uh, had a close game there until through three quarters, and then boy, just so many interceptions and fumbles and oh my gosh, they really really gave it away there at the end. Uh, in the military academies, it was SMU over Navy forty to thirty four. It was Army over an FCS team Colgate forty two to seventeen. And Air Force over UNLV, 42-7. to seven. From here on out, we have uh, three random scores from all the different levels of college football. We're going to start with the FCS level, where Maine defeated Monmouth, 38-28. to 28. Florida A&M, A&M over Grambling, 20-16. to 16. And Harvard over an HBCU school, Howard, 41-25. to 25. This is just the fifth time that an Ivy League uh, team and an HBU team have met on the gridiron. Howard University also played Yale on October 1st, losing 34 to 26. That's kind of kind of cool that uh, you know an HBCU school and an Ivy League school are playing against each other. I guess they've been playing the last four or five years, uh, but before that, I don't think they had ever uh, uh, met on the gridiron before. But I, I kind of like this. Uh, you know, this is you know, what they're doing with their non-conference games now. So I like it. I like it a lot. Division two. Grand Valley State squeaked by Ferris State 22-21. to By the way, these are all uh, Michigan scores, teams in Michigan from the Division II. Michigan Tech over Northern Michigan 21-7. to And Hillsdale College over Northwood 41-7. to Why would you not highlight any Division II teams from other parts of the country? Just Michigan, huh? I just felt like highlighting Michigan teams this week. Uh-huh. The bias that happens on this show is ridiculous for uh-huh. the world of football. It's it's not the peninsula of football, sir. It is the world of football, as you have named this channel slash website. Go back to taking a nap over there until I'm done reading Okay. This All right, Division Three: the Merchant Marine shut out MIT 17 to nothing. Wartburg, I love that name. Wartburg shut out Nebraska Wesleyan 65 to nothing. And Adrian over Kalamazoo College... 42 to 17. Two more, oh, there two we more go. Michigan Another teams. Kalamazoo reference. Uh-huh. La de freaking da. What? <laughs> Man, hey, we're, this is where we live. This is what we're highlighting. Get used to it. But the name of the show is <laughs> The World of Football. I remember that, yes. And you're talking about the mitten of football right now. <laughs> uh, let's see. We're going to go on to the NAIA. Okay, there better not be any Michigan teams in this bunch of scores. Um, yes, there is. Uh, number 10, Marion. Of, I, I'm not sure if that's Ohio or where, but Marion over St. Francis from Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is just south of the Michigan border, uh, 37 to 10. It was Dickinson State of North Dakota over number 22 Waldorf of Iowa, 50 to 7, in their homecoming game. Imagine that Dickinson State hosting the number 22 team at their level and beating them 50 to 7. On their homecoming. Man, I'll bet you they tore down the goalpost there and threw those in the river. They probably had a little more respect. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And then finally, at the NAIA level, it was Taylor of Indiana over Concordia of Michigan, 24-21. Uh, to 21. Color me shocked. <laughs> All right, at the junior college level, Minnesota State over Minnesota West, 49-8. to 8. Northeast Mississippi over East Mississippi, 31-21. to 21. And of course, our beloved Snow College Badgers improved to five and two with a win over Garden City, twenty-three to twenty, in their homecoming game. So, see, it's not just Michigan teams; it's teams that are named Snow. I like uh huh. All right, moving up to Canada, U Sports in Canada. It was Western Ontario over Windsor, fifty to eighteen. Saint Francis Xavier over Acadia, forty-six to eleven, and Laurier over Guelph, or Guelph. Uh, 38 to 25. 
And in the Canadian Junior Football League, it's actually their playoffs have started already up there. They had a few regular season games, but I'm just going to uh, uh, talk about the four playoff games they had. It was the London Beef Eaters over the Ottawa Sooners, 38-14. to The Okanagan Sun over the Langley Rams, 44-20. to The St. Clair Saints shut out the Hamilton Hurricanes, 44 to nothing, And the West Shore Rebels shut out the Valley Huskers, 34 to zero. So next week we're going to have the semifinals in the Junior Football League up there and it's going to be the London Beef Eaters versus the St. Clair Saints, the Okanagan Sun versus the West Shore Rebels and the winners of those two games are going to meet in the championship game. I don't know if it's the following weekend or two weekends after that but uh, those, those winners will meet in the championship game. And that is it for this week's World of Football scoreboard. From Michigan to the rest of the world we cover it all. All right, I'm going to move on to some NFL news. Uh, Washington quarterback Carson Wentz suffered a fractured ring finger, had surgery, and was probably out for the next four to six weeks. He's going to be replaced by uh, quarterback Taylor Heineke, who started 15 games for the Commanders last year. So I guess they're not in too bad of a shape. They've got a, a guy that's used to being a starting quarterback there. I but guess. I'm sure there's some fans who are fed up with Carson Wentz anyway, so I'm sure they... They're secretly, we're hoping for this kind of change. I don't remember hearing any chance of put in Heineke, put in Heineke. I think they were just get rid of the quarterback <laughs> we got in now. Yeah. yeah, we just want to change. So that's too bad for him. I mean, uh, he came there with a lot of promise, and so far it, is, it hasn't quite worked out the way he had expected or anybody had expected for Washington. But uh, hope, uh, hope he gets a speedy recovery and gets back uh, on the gridiron again. Uh, In another story, Bill Belichick has tied George Hallis for second all-time in the number of wins in the NFL with 324. Uh, He's he's just uh, 23 games behind Don Shula, who's in first place all-time with 347 wins. Uh, You know, he's... Give him another season or two, and he could have it by you know sometime next season, possibly. Possibly. If uh, if the Patriots really catch fire. But uh, I don't know if that's if that's all-time wins or if that's just regular season wins. Uh, that didn't say when I was reading that. So um, if that includes playoffs, you know, he could make that a little sooner. But I fully expect him to eventually be the, the top. Uh, I think that's what he's sticking around for. Top in wins in the NFL. Yeah, could be. So we'll see. And uh, here's a story that just came out a little while ago. In fact, you didn't even know this until you walked in the door. But uh, Bill Bell... Oh, no, that's the wrong story. Where did you Amazon, <laughs> Amazon Prime will air a new Black Friday game the day after Thanksgiving next year in 2023. Um, the reason for that, uh, this year Prime does not have a Thursday night football game on Thanksgiving. Uh, that goes to NBC. I guess NBC's been, you know, it's, it's been NBC, CBS, and uh, Fox having the Thursday right. games. And, you know, they, and they've got the Thursday night game now all the time, but I guess they're not giving them the Thanksgiving game. So uh, they're throwing them a, a bone and giving them a, a new game on Thursday. Hey, it works out good for the NFL. They get, uh, you know, another game on a holiday weekend when everybody's sitting around. And this game, I guess, is actually, it's not going to be a primetime game. It's going to be 3 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time kickoff. Yeah. But uh, chances are, as long as uh, uh, Amazon Prime has a contract with the NFL, they're probably going to have that game every year. So you can, you know, once they add a game, they normally don't take it away. So they'll just find somebody else to take right. that, that game or the whole Friday uh, Thursday night package. So, yeah, so it looks like we're going to have three games on Thanksgiving, a game on uh, Black Friday, and then the rest of the NFL schedule on Sunday from, from here on out. Right. Uh, so XFL news. Nope, you got two more NFL oh, that's right. stories. That's right. Uh, the, I guess the Tennessee Titans, you brought this to my attention. Yeah. I hadn't seen this. Tennessee Titans uh, are getting a new stadium. Uh, it's going to be a dome stadium, supposedly, and which could cost around uh, $2.1 billion. Uh, however, the whole thing must be approved by the Metro Council. So it's not totally a done deal, I guess, but uh, that's what they're leaning towards. And everybody wants a dome stadium now that's up that's north, other than Green Bay. All about hosting you know? that Super Bowl. Yeah, man. Minnesota's now got a dome stadium. Chicago's looking at a well, dome Minnesota's stadium. Minnesota's always had a dome stadium. Well, no, they used to play outside for many, well, that, many then years. Then they played the Metro Dome for many years. Right, so. right. Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they got that new big glass stadium out there. Uh, but no, I remember days when they played out in the cold. It, it was about as bad as Green Bay. You see the guy's right. breath, and oh my gosh, what a mess! But um, 
Yeah, I think, and I've always said that the teams up north should have a dome stadium just to make it easier on the fans. But you know, that's part of the home field advantage and all. But but now it's all about we want to host a Super Bowl. Oh, speaking you, of home field advantage, how did we not talk about this story during the Dolphins game against the Vikings? How the, the way their stadium is built, that the sideline for the Dolphins was thirty degrees cooler than the sideline for the Vikings. Not that it helped them win because mm. the Vikings got the win. Mm. But the thirty degree difference, like at eighty degrees on their side, one hundred and ten on the side for the mm. for the Vikings. That's just a nut, you know, nutty just <laughs> home field advantage when it whenever it gets that hot and however wow. the stadium is built. So when the sun's going by, right. you know, the shadow is always in a certain spot. So. Let's give a shout out to engineering. It's football <laughs> I'm sure stadium. that was, that was I'm sure that was planned. Oh, I'm that sure way. it was too. Just like how the Lions have the long walk to the locker room for the away team when the Lions got a very short walk mm, to the locker room. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. That was the only other story we nope, had. Nope. For... You've got one more that oh. you accidentally put in the college news section. Don't worry. I've been looking at your notes. Why? Oh, receiver. okay. Yep. yep. Wide receiver Robbie Anderson uh, released from the Panthers. We kind of talked about that already. Well, he wasn't released. He was traded. Well, he was he was kicked off the team or sent to the locker rooms in he the was, third yeah, quarter. Yeah, he was pretty much just kicked out of the game by his coach, own coach. Coach had had it with him, and uh, he went to the locker room. And the very next day, they traded him, and they traded him to the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, and what they're getting in, re- in return, I thought it was just one draft pick, but it's two. They're getting a sixth-round pick in 2024. Not next year, but 2024. And then a seventh-round pick in 2025. So they're getting two draft picks for a guy that they didn't want on their team anymore. Hey, this might work out well for Arizona. You know, and, and Maybe they just had a wide Anderson. receiver go down, too. So, yeah. So yeah. Uh, hopefully it works out for everybody. You know, the Panthers are happy. Robbie's happy. The Cardinals are happy. Everybody's happy. Yep. <clears throat> All right, now you can move on. Okay, now we go uh, on to the XFL news. Uh, let's see. The XFL and the Indoor Football League have formed a partnership for players. The two leagues will also work together in scheduling joint practices, or I'm sorry, joint tryouts, and sharing videos and game films. So I think it's kind of good. They, uh, you know, they're going to have uh, uh, players who are in game condition, uh, ready to go. You know, uh, some of these players might move up uh, from the IFL to the XFL, get a chance to be, you know, looked at, and possibly wind up in the NFL. Or, you know, if a guy maybe just needs a little more time and, you know, is not quite making it in the XFL, they're going to send him to the IFL where he can get some more reps, uh, you know, uh, as a wide receiver or maybe a quarterback or whatever. So um, I think it's going to be good for both of them. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Now you're on to college news. Am I really? Okay. Yep. Um, I, I think we already uh, talked about this, you know, that uh, former FCS school James Madison was 5-0. and uh, and they were in the top 25. Yeah, we've basically already talked about okay, that. Okay, well, that, you're the one who made the notes, not okay. me. Okay, and and the last story in college, which um, I just uh, learned about earlier, just just before you got here for this uh, podcast, uh, the University of Tennessee has had a disassembled backup set of goalposts stored under the su- student section of the stadium ever since it was ordered back in 1998, uh, the last time the fans tore down the goalposts. So... I was wondering all week, you know, where are they going? Are they going to be able to get replacement goalposts? Are they going to get them up in time? Because I guess they've got a game this weekend, and now I find out that they've already had a, a set of uh, goalposts that are you know, disassembled and stored under the student section that have been sitting there for twenty four years. Well, a good thing the the goalposts don't change much over. I was going to say it'd be weird if they get them all put together and then they find out none of the none of the holes line up on the on the new base. Well, that or and the dimensions are wrong. Yeah. Find out it's it's one of those old ones where it looks like a letter H instead of a. <laughs> well, if it was, even if it was ordered Kermans. back in '98, there's I, no yeah, way. I know, I know, but I, I I was wondering all week long. I wonder. I haven't heard anything. Everybody's about, been wondering about whether they've ordered them, where they're getting them from, and who's who who's gonna install them and all that. But yeah, they've already had some, so they were prepared for this, and good for them. Uh, before we get on to anything else, I wanted to talk just for a minute about uh, our PFRA meeting that we had. Uh, Last Sunday, uh, this is the second year in a row that I've gotten together with some buddies here in Michigan uh, from the Pro Football Research- Researchers Association, and uh, we just we have lunch um, on the the bye week. We did the same thing last year. We got together in Ann Arbor at a restaurant, and this year we got together in Frankenmuth, Michigan, uh, which is kind of nice. It's like a two and a half hour drive from here, but man, it was a gorgeous day for a drive and uh, heading to the Frankenmuth, and we had stopped at a place called Slow Bones Barbecue, and it was really good. 
you were chastising me for not getting barbecue. I actually had a French dip sandwich. Yeah, you go to a barbecue place and get a French dip sandwich. The French dip was that should really be good. rule number I one for French kicking, dip sandwich. Kick this man out of the PFRA. <laughs> but uh, Arnie Chapman was there, the football history dude uh, with his podcast. Uh, he was there. That's the first time I actually met Arnie in person, so it was good to meet him. And then uh, Steve Forrester, who uh, you and I have met a couple of times at the Lions training camp. And uh, Bill Lambert was also there. Uh, we had two other guys that were supposed to join us, but uh, for whatever reasons, they couldn't make it this, this time. So we'll look forward to seeing them next year. So what we've been doing with our little Michigan chapter of the PFRA is uh, uh, we, we try to meet uh, at the Lions training camp. You know, we'll set a date, see when everybody can make it. And we'll just sit there and watch the Lions. And then we try to meet during the bye week, too, and we'll go someplace and have lunch. So... Um, it's kind of good to, to see them uh, every now and then. And next summer, uh, some of these guys are all going to be at the uh, PFRA convention in Pittsburgh, which I'm hoping that you're going to get to go to also, yeah, uh, we'll if, if the dates work out. It's in July of uh, next year. So uh, a lot of good things going on with the Pro Football Research Association, and uh, it's good to see these guys every now and then. Okay, Arena Football TV on YouTube. Uh, there were no new games posted uh, so far this week, so uh, maybe next week we'll have a new game. You know, there's going to come a point when they're going to have going to have just about all the games out there on YouTube uh, that you can watch from the entire 32 years of uh, Arena Football League. Uh, you know, they may not have every game on on video somewhere, but the ones they do have, and they they've got like over 500 right now that are all posted. Um, just there to to be enjoyed and and uh you know maybe maybe you were at a game maybe you remember a team you want to see what it was like check out arena football tv on youtube today's birthdays october 18th coach mike ditka turns 83 years old today and we're going to have a little bit more on mike uh, ditka in our history lesson so i'm not going to talk much about him but the other birthday that we want to talk about today is wide receiver boyd dowler he turns 85 years old today he played his uh, college football at Colorado and was selected in the third round of the 1959 NFL Draft by the Green Bay Packers. He played for the Packers from 1959 to 1969 and the Washington Redskins in 1971 where he was reunited with uh, uh, Coach Lombardi there in the Washington uh, Redskins. Uh, he won five NFL titles over the course of his career and the first two Super Bowls with the Packers. He was also inducted into the Packers Hall of Fame in 1978. And I got my picture taken by his, uh, what they do with the Packers Hall of Fame, they don't have busts of the individuals, but they have these uh, like bronze footballs and they have the person's name and number on these balls. So I got my picture taken with uh, Boyd Dowler's uh, football in the Packers Hall of Fame because I actually wrote about him in the PFRA book about the 1966 Packers team. So um, kind of nice to say happy birthday to Boyd Dowler, 85 years old today. All right, now we've got a couple of obituaries to talk about today. Uh, the first one is John Shinners, a guard in the NFL for nine seasons. He has passed away at the age of 75. Shinners played college football at Xavier of Ohio and was selected in the 17th, with the 17th overall pick in the 1969 NFL Draft by the New Orleans Saints. He played for the Saints from 1969 to 1971, the Baltimore Colts in 1972, and he finished his career with the Cincinnati Bengals from 1973 to 1977. All right, our next obituary is that of Robert Pennywell, who was a guard in the NFL and the USFL and has passed away at the age of 67. Pennywell played college football at Grambling State and was selected in the sixth round of the 1976 NFL Draft by the San Francisco 49ers. However, he ended up signing with the Atlanta Falcons, where he played from 1977 to 1980. He then went and played for the Michigan Panthers of the United States Football League yes. in 1983 and 1984, winning that USFL title in 1983. He then finished his playing career with the USFL's Portland Breakers in 1985. Yeah, I I remember him now. I, I When I heard the name Robert Pennywell, I was like, where do I know that name from? And then I realized, yeah, he was a member of the Michigan Panthers team uh, back in 83 and 84, so... Uh, and finally, the last obituary today is that of Frank Uso, a tackle in the NFL and the American Football League, has passed away at the age of 86. Uso played college football at Minnesota and was selected in the second round of the 1958 NFL Draft by the New York Giants. He played for the Giants from 1958 to 1960 and played in back-to-back -back NFL championship games in 1958 and 59, but lost both of them to the Baltimore Colts. 
He also played for the Minnesota Vikings in 1961 and 1962 and the Oakland Raiders of the American Football League from 1963 to 1965. All right, uh, anything pop up on your phone that we need to talk about before we get into this week's history lesson? Uh, does not look like we have any breaking news at all. Okay, good. Well, this week we're going to continue our discussion with Part 7 of the Greatest Player Nicknames in Football History. And uh, this week, they're all Hall of Famers. So we're going to start with the first one, defensive back Neon Dion Sanders, also known as Primetime. He got the primetime nickname from a high school teammate after he scored 30 points in a basketball game. I did not know that until I looked this up. Uh, he played college football at Florida State and was the fifth overall pick in the 1989 NFL Draft by the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, he played 14 NFL seasons with the Falcons, 49ers, Cowboys, and Ravens and won back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Uh, he won Super Bowl 29 with the 49ers and Super Bowl 30 with the Cowboys. He also played center field in the Major League Baseball uh, between 1989 and 2001 for the New York Yankees, Atlanta Braves, San Francisco Giants, and the Cincinnati Reds. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2011, and he's currently the head coach at HBCU Jackson State. In fact, he was just on 60 Minutes. I was going to say, did yeah. you watch that 60 yeah, Minutes? Yeah, I did. We did. We watched, uh, watched that. That was pretty good. Um, I, I like... Uh, uh, Deion Sanders uh, being a coach down there. I think that's a perfect fit for him and those, and those kids at that HBCU school. Uh, the next one on our list is Coach Iron Mike Ditka, a tough player and an even tougher coach. Played college football at the University of Pittsburgh and was the fifth overall pick in the 1961 NFL Draft by the Chicago Bears. He was also the eighth overall pick that year in the AFL Draft by the Houston Oilers. He played for the Bears from 1961 to 1966, the Philadelphia Eagles in 67 and 68, and the Dallas Cowboys from 69 to 72. He won Super Bowl VI as a player, and he was also the head coach of the Bears from 82 to 92, and the New Orleans Saints from 97 to 99. He won Super Bowl XX with the Bears as the head coach, and he famously traded away all of New Orleans draft picks in 1999 to get running back Ricky Williams of Texas. And then he was gone the next season. <laughs> I mean, Ditka was, not uh, Ricky Williams. But Ditka was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1988. Next is wide receiver and defensive back touchdown Eddie Brown from the Arena Football League. He got the nickname while he was playing in Albany because he was scoring so many touchdowns the announcer kept saying, touchdown, Eddie Brown, touchdown, Eddie Brown. And the nickname just kind of stuck because he was a touchdown machine. He played his college football at Louisiana Tech. He played for the AFL's Albany Firebirds from 1994 to 2000. And then the team moved to Indiana, so he played for the Indiana Firebirds from 2001 to 2003. He won Arena Bowl 13 in 1999 with Albany. And he was also the head coach of the AF2's Fort Wayne Fusion in 2007. Boy, we, we've attended a lot of games down there. I covered that team that season for Arena Fan, and I got to interview Eddie Brown after the games. You talk about an intense guy. Uh, he didn't like losing, and uh, um, he was quite the guy. I remember uh, before the season even started, I was talking to him one day, and he didn't know who I was. And uh, he mistakenly thought that I was part of the staff from the Fusion, and he started chewing me out for something that didn't get posted on the website. Hmm. You've got to do a better job of getting this stuff on a website. I give you guys this information. I said, Coach, I'm, I'm, I don't work for the team. And he's like, oh. <laughs> so I don't know if he just confused me because I looked like somebody else there. But uh, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I wasn't working there because he was really upset about something and he thought it was my fault. Uh, let's see, where was I here? Uh, he was voted, Eddie Brown was voted, the greatest player in Arena Football League history in 2006 during the AFL's 20th season celebration. He's the father of uh, wide receiver Antonio Brown, formerly of the NFL. Don't know if he'll ever play again in the NFL. But uh, Eddie Brown, touchdown Eddie Brown, should not be confused with another guy that played in, in the Arena Football League, downtown Eddie Brown, who played his college football at Michigan State and played 11 seasons in the AFL from 92 to 2002 with the Tampa Bay Storm, the Connecticut Coyotes, the New York City Hawks, and the Buffalo Destroyers. 
Touchdown Andy Brown was inducted into the Arena Football League Hall of Fame in 2011 in the same class with quarterback Kurt Warner. Next on our list of uh, great nicknames is quarterback Terry Bradshaw, who was known as the Blonde Bomber. And not anymore, folks. He <laughs> lost all of his hair. But, yeah, you see some of the old pictures of Terry Bradshaw. He had a pretty good head of blonde hair on him. And uh, uh, <laughs> it's it's unusual because most people today, they don't even remember him as a quarterback. A lot of young people, you never saw him play. So all of you know is not. the Terry Bradshaw. Well, I've seen on. the highlights. So I know he Yeah, well, the highlights with his helmet on, so you wouldn't have seen his hair. But I've seen him without his helmet on back in the day. Come on. Uh, he played his college football at Louisiana Tech. And he was the first overall pick in the 1970 NFL Draft by the Pittsburgh Steelers. He played 14 seasons with the Steelers from 1970 to 1983, of course, all with the Steelers, and won four Super Bowls in the 1970s. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1989. Since then, he's appeared in movies, TV shows. Uh, most notably, he's, he's known for the CBS and Fox NFL Sunday pregame show. And I think his... Uh, Nickname probably came from uh, Daryl LaMonica, who was known as the Be- the Mad Bomber. And uh, so Terry Bradshaw got the nickname of the Blonde Bomber. But, I mean, he was on Married with Children one episode, uh, and, or a couple episodes, because they you know, were, were both on Fox. And um, he was also in Smokey and the Bandit 2, I think. And uh, so, yeah, he's done all kinds of stuff. Um, but, yeah, Terry Bradshaw, the Blonde Bomber. And finally on our list this week, it's wide receiver Bullet Bob Hayes. He started out as a track star and won gold medals in the 100-meter dash and the 400-meter relay in the 1964 Olympics before going to the NFL. He went to college at Florida A&M. He was the uh, uh, seventh-round pick in the 1964 NFL draft by the Cowboys and a 14th-round pick in the 1964 AFL draft by the Denver Broncos. He played 11 seasons in the NFL. He was with the Cowboys from 65 to 74, the San Francisco 49ers in 1975. Yeah, I guess that's the only two teams. But he won Super Bowl VI with the Cowboys, and uh, same as Mike Ditka. And he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2009. So we had a couple of guys that played on the Super Bowl team together. We had a couple of guys that both went to Louisiana Tech for college, but they were all Hall of Famers. And so recapping... Defensive back Neon Deion Sanders, also known as Primetime. Iron Mike Ditka. Touchdown Eddie Brown. Terry Bradshaw, the Blonde Bomber. And Bullet Bob Hayes, a wide receiver. And that's it for this week's history lesson. So now we're going to move on to our upcoming events calendar. Saturday, October 29th, the CFL regular season ends and their playoffs will begin. Sunday, October 30th, the Denver Broncos versus the Jacksonville Jaguars at Wembley Stadium in London. That's a 9.30 a.m. kickoff on ESPN+. Plus. So, uh, yeah, it might be a little difficult for some people to find that game. Sunday, November 13th, Seattle Seahawks versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in Munich, Germany. That's another 9.30 a.m. kickoff. That is going to be on NFL Network. Sunday, November 20th, the CFL Grey Cup Championship game is going to take place in Saskatchewan on ESPN. Monday, November 21st, the San Francisco 49ers versus the Arizona Cardinals in Mexico City. That is going to be the Monday night football game on ESPN. And that is everything I had for this week's show. Jam-packed show. (laughs) Anything else that uh, you wanted to add? No no breaking news. Uh, You know how Tuesdays are. It's usually after we... Go off the yeah. air. Well, like I said, I found a couple of stories today that uh, that popped up just you know about an hour before we started recording. So uh, you never know. T- Mondays and Tuesdays are big days for news. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got for this week. If you learned something about the, if you learned something during this podcast about the incredible amount of diversity that exists in the world of football, then we have done our job. Visit our website at theworldoffootball.com for news, links, upcoming events, videos, and more. Our email address is info at theworldoffootball.com. You can also like The World of Football on Facebook at TWOF Kalamazoo. You can also follow our Twitter account. The address there is at TWOF Kalamazoo. New episodes of this very podcast are posted on Tuesdays and are available on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and our YouTube channel. Just search for The World of Football Kalamazoo where you'll find the videos we've been doing lately, which are mainly the weekly NFL picks videos yep. 
and then the audio versions of this podcast that you're listening to yep. right now. So please subscribe to the channel, rate, review, give us a like, leave a comment on anything. Uh, let us know what you think, and please just be a part of the football conversation. It's been fun having people making picks with us mm -hmm. on our YouTube page for the weekly picks. So why don't you join in, fellow listener? <laughs> Yeah, we've got a lot of football conversation going on here, and we'd, we'd love to hear some other people's opinions. Right or wrong, uh, we'll let you know if you're right or wrong or not. And remember, folks, some people may love football more than we do, but nobody, and I mean nobody, loves more football than the two of us. Until next time, I'm Randy Snow. And I'm his son, Adam Snow. <laughs> and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>